Thanks very much to my co-panelists and to you all for still being here. I know I'm the last speaker of the day, so I hope to keep you awake. Um, I would like to thank also Matt and the organizers uh, for inviting me, a linguistic anthropologist conducting research in Russia, to contribute my expertise to such fruitful and engaging symposium. So let me present a topic that has been at the core of my research for more than a decade now, and that is the revival of an, of an indigenous minority language in Northwest Russia. Today, I will explore the intricate relationship between citizenship and belonging to a minority indigenous group in Russia through an analysis of language revival efforts. These efforts have progressively shifted from a focus on equality to equity. So I will illustrate how indigenous futures were conceptualized at the outset of the revival movement in the late 1980s, influencing the ways in which revival efforts took place and how these uh, approaches have evolved over time in response to a dynamic ecology fostering dialogue between citizenship and indigeneity. So that's uh, the outline of the lecture. First of all, I will introduce you to VEPS, an indigenous minority of Russia. Then I will explore the connections between citizenship and social justice, highlighting the distinction between equality and equity. And then the presentation body is also divided into two main parts. The first part will discuss the late 1980s VEPSian revival, language and culture. Oh, well, Western language and cultural revival, emphasizing the focus then on equality within the social justice framework. And meanwhile, the second part we cover recent developments in the revival movement and how equity then, rather than equality, has emerged as a predominant goal within the social justice model. The concluding part of, of this presentation will investigate what might still be missing from the revival efforts and thus its connections to social justice and citizenship. All right, so VEPs are recognized as a Finno Greek minority within the Russian Federation. They predominantly inhabit the territory highlighted in red. Uh, traditionally, they have resided in the northwestern regions of Russia, primarily within three different administrative regions. And these are the Republic of Karelia, uh, or Karelia uh, the Leningrad and Vologda oblasts. Vepsian settlements are typically located in forested rural areas with villages nestled amidst forests, swamps, lakes and rivers. However, significant changes have occurred in the latter half of the 20th century due to migration to larger city and the population of rural villages. I hope you can see those numbers here, yeah, so oh, maybe not, but so that's predominantly inhabited rural areas across these three different administrative regions where they traditionally resided. However, the number of individuals identifying as VEPs has steadily declined. So the revival movement of the late 1980s aimed to reverse this trend. Uh, activists initially experienced fervor and an increase in the number of individuals self-identifying as VEPs, rising from 7,550 in 1979 to 12,142 in 1989. This surge was linked to heightened ethnic uh, consciousness and enthusiasm for a new future where my indigenous minorities in Russia could thrive. Uh, however, by 2002, uh, the vaccine population in Russia had decreased again to 8,280, further declining to 5,936 in 2010. So these figures continue to raise questions regarding revival efforts, citizenship, and the identity of this indigenous group. 
Not only did the number of vets in population continue to drop, but vets experienced anxiety also regarding the loss of their, well, traditional culture due to this migration from rural settlements to cities, uh, with all the implications it carries for their relationship with the land and its human and non-human inhabitants, and also the loss of their heritage language. Therefore, the efforts were primarily directed towards ensuring that both uh, their culture and heritage language would be promoted and revitalized. So here, uh, let me just briefly introduce the language at land. Um, it's very different from Russian, uh, which is a dominant language in the region. It's a Finno-Greek language belonging to the Phoenix branch. Uh, it's not an Indo-European language like Russian. Uh, and the balto Phoenix languages share uh, several common features which are listed here, and I will, I will not go uh, into too many details, but just for you to understand that they differ from Russian very much. So after this brief introduction, then let me turn to the core of the presentation. Since today I would like to problematize the notion of social justice, which allows for imagining different indigenous futures through an analysis of then the late 1980s and the contemporary Vepsian revival movement. So the notion of social justice, um, I would argue, is tightly intertwined with that uh, citizenship, and that was actually already somewhat introduced in previous presentations. Um, while a dominant conception of citizenship is tied to the existence of the state and the principle of public sovereignty, and supposedly encompasses full civil, political, and social rights, Social justice aimed to ensure that discriminated, marginalized and often minoritized groups do indeed exercise those rights and have access to the same opportunity as all other citizens. So investigating two different periods of Vepsian language revitalization enables me to draw parallels between key concepts within social justice theories, namely equality and equity, and experiences of language revival while observing how those affected imagine indigenous futures respectively. A core cool concept in the social justice literature is that of equality, um, which encourages inclusiveness and participation for all, aiming to improve the situation of those who are often discriminated against excluded and marginalized. Equality suggests that the same opportunities are made available to all and everyone is treated the same way. The indigenous language activists in Northwest Russia in the late 1980s, uh, possibly unconsciously, but also in line with the dominant uh, socialist ideology of the time, adopted such equality strategies when they employed the structural approach to language, codifying, codifying and standardizing it, and employing it for publishing and educational purposes in all regions where VEPs resided. This experience allowed them to envision a future where the indigenous languages would gain ground and prestige in a Russian dominant uh, ecology. The second core concept within this social justice literature is that then of equity, which indicates how services and supports can indeed be tailored to match the different needs and assets people have. This line of thought appears to align with the more recent experiences of language activism, which have provided speakers with the opportunity to use their own linguistic variety, such as dialects, but also the standardized Vepsian language, to demonstrate full fluency in the language or the ability to utter only a few sentences. With this more recent um, wave of language revitalization, linguistic diversity has been valued and legitimized. A focus then on equity seems to be more prominent, although acknowledging overlaps between the two periods. 
equity in languages does allow uh, indigenous language speakers, Vexian speakers, to access services and fully enjoy their rights to speak and express themselves in the heritage language in such spaces as speaking clubs or folklore festivals or NGOs initiatives where activists and speakers of the language have carved out a niche and uh, is sustainable as a future for themselves within this dominant Russian-speaking ecology. So let's go back to the 1980s. The Vepsian revival movement began with a festival called Elupu in Vepsian or Derieva Zizni in Russian Tree of Life in Vinitsi. Um, in Leningrad Oblast in 1987, and this is a picture from that event. Uh, the following year, the activists attracted the attention of the authorities from Moscow and organized a conference on the linguistic and socio-economic situation of VEPS um, at the Academy of Sciences in Petrazavosk, which is the capital of the Republic of Karelia, so the northern region where VEPS uh, live. On this occasion, then, um, uh, oh, sorry, some of the main actors were then uh, the linguist Zaitseva on the right and the ethnographer uh, Zinaida Strogashikova, who on this occasion also founded the NGO Society of Vepsian Culture. While requests were made to the administration from Moscow to incite a return to village life, um, these were declined, potentially and possibly due to economic reasons. Funding, however, were guaranteed for the revival of the language. So language revival became political action. The activists co-joined their goal and operated towards the revival of the language, both working on the status planning and the corpus planning of Epsion. The status planning was then led by Srogashikova and the corpus planning by Zaitseva. So as just, just mentioned, Zaitseva led this codification and standardization of the, la the Vepsian language and together with indeed other linguists at the Academy of Sciences, she focused on creating a codified form of the Vepsian language, including the development of an alphabet, its lexicon, morphology and phonology. They indeed addressed many questions and their responses indicate that they aim to provide equal opportunities to all Vepsian population. So first of all, they opted for uh, the Latin alphabet, the Latin script as was already done in the 30s during the first wave of, you know, uh, uh, indigenous revitalization called Karenizatia in, in, in Russia. Uh, other concerns, however, included the Vepsian vocabulary, which uh, I was told mostly lacked contemporary words. Uh, and indeed, the activists indicated that, and, I, and again, quote, well, a translation of the quote, people always lament that there are not enough words in Vepsian. So compensating for the poverty of the Vepsian lexicon became the priority of the language activists. And they progressively then works in three different directions. They cooperated with the teachers, they cooperated with the researchers as students who were sent out to the villages to conduct research. And also they applied what they called the Vepsian logic, following morphosyntactic patterns for the creation of new words. And here there is an example. So the word hang, pitchfork existed in Vepsian, but the word fork, didn't exist, so they applied the, 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 well, they added the suffix ine to then create a new word so that would be familiar to, uh, to the population. When dealing then with Vepsian phonology and morphology, the linguists agreed that, and again, uh, a translation of the quote, the most intelligible uh, variant would represent the base for the model language. Basically, they did not choose one dialect to be standardized, as was the case in the 1930s. Rather, they selected the forms to, de to be standardized from all dialects spoken in the territory. 
This approach, again, has its foundation in an understanding that equality provides social justice for all vaccine speakers with all being represented in the newly codified and standardized language. School books then, journals, newspapers began to be published, again financed by the Republic of Karelia. Then a radio, TV station also commenced operations based on this new language. Literacy became intertwined with political power, uh, enabling scholars and activists to secure funding for various activities, gain visibility and prestige. So the actions of these individuals were then guided by an ideology uh, suggesting that literacy could promote social justice, again, with a, with a focus on equality in this unequal society. Let's look also at some action taken towards the status planning of Vepsian, which was then led by Zinaida Srogashikova. Here you've got a list of um, acts and legislation. Um, so in 1991, the Karelian government passed this non-Russian district council act to ensure that the use of Vepsian, but also Karelian languages in the administration and um, educational spheres. Between 92 and 93, then the Vepsian villages of the Republic of Karelia, these three villages, Sholtezera, Rebrika and Shoksha, obtained national status, which then led to the establishment of the Vepsian National District in 94, and also the introduction of the Vepsian language education at school. In the same year, a law on education for the indigenous peoples of the Republic of Karelia also passed. In 1997, the word Malachislini, which literally means a small numbered, basically a minority, was also added to the title of the law, um, which previously only referred to indigenous peoples, uh, and this could then be applied to uh, Vepsian villagers living not only in Karelia, but also now the Leningrad Oblast. In 2000, Vepsian obtained the status of national language in Karelia, alongside with Karelian, while Russian remained the state language, according then to the languages of the, in, in the Republic of Karelia Act. And in the same year, VEPS obtained then the status of minority indigenous peoples of the Russian Federation, uh, which granted them also with the status of minority indigenous peoples of the north of Siberia and the Far East in 2006. And thanks to this, then they were able to uh, open a school in Shalter, so given that the funding right because of that. The aim again was to provide equal rights and access to the same opportunities to all VEPs living in the three different administrative regions, so in Karelia, in the Leningrad and Vologda Oblasts. Once again, the scholar activists worked towards an understanding of social justice that focused on equality, ensured that all Vepsian nationals would be provided with equal rights and opportunities, at least from a, le a legislative standpoint. Little by little, as you imagine, the students of Vepsian, those who indeed benefited from the first wave of the revival movement, completed their studies and started working in different spheres, uh, primarily continuing to promote their heritage language. Uh, their work not only continued um, the efforts initi initiated in the late 1980s, but also began providing new directions and adding to the new dimensions to the revival of Vepsian, which I argue indeed matches a more equity-oriented sense of justice. Some of them became journalists for the Vepsian radio, TV and newspapers, some became teachers, others started implementing various initiatives through the NGO Vepsian Society. In 2010, for example, the Pagging Club, literally a main speaking club, and this picture is taken from there, uh, it was founded. Uh, this club aimed at gathering VEPs who were resident in Petra Zavosk, so the capital of Karelia, to speak in Vepsian. Relying on a network of the members of the society at first, several VEPs started weekly meetings to meet and exchange experiences while speaking Vepsian. 
It soon emerged that the Vepsian speakers at different levels of fluency, uh, as some uh, left their home village at a young age and primarily spoke Russian at home. Uh, others spoke different dialects since they came from different parts of, of the territory covered by Vepsian settlements. Besides, the organizers of such events uh, learned Vepsian at school and university and never engaged in, you know, spoken Vepsian at home. Uh, this, however, did not impede the members and participants from understanding one another. If anything, uh, and I witnessed this a few times, the discussion would often rotate around how certain words would be translated in the various dialects known by the speakers or the club's members. Um, a word that, that seemed to be very interesting for many of the members was that mushroom, because, you know, living in the forest, you have lots of mushrooms. So, um, sien uh, is the Vepsian word for, for mushroom. Uh, many would use grip, which is the corresponding Russian, but it was already appropriated. And so it felt as if grip was, in fact, a Vepsian word as well. So just to give you a sense of the kind of discussions that are going on in this uh, environment. Members of all ages have been welcomed to join the club, and most often the main participants would be elderly, retired VAPs who come along with their nieces and nephews, and university students of Vepsian. Sometimes also VAPs living overseas are invited via Skype primarily to join and share their experiences abroad while also speaking Vepsian. So, as you can see, inclusivity of diverse language epistemologies and experiences were the foundation of the work of the Pagin Club. No discrimination indeed was made in this space regarding the variety of language that the speakers used, the level of fluency or their age. The only requirement was the desire to come and engage in speaking the language. And it could be argued then uh, that such a shift in the revival efforts and practices corresponding also to an ideological shift, moving from a more socialist approach to a more neoliberal approach aimed at fulfilling individual needs and valuing individual differences. The first Vepsian uh, festival took place in the Leningrad Oblast, as I indicated earlier, where most Veps used to live at the time. But also, as indicated at the beginning of the presentation, demographics changed and the northern Vepsian settlements also started organizing their own summer festivals and various events throughout the year, thanks primarily to the financial support of the government of the Republic of Karelia, something that VEPs in the other regions did not necessarily gain. So that's important also to understand. An example of this is then this festival called Kala Ramd, uh, which literally means fish show. Kala meaning fish around show, from the name of the village itself, which is Rybrika in Russian, but Kalaik in Vepsian. Um, so the, the pictures are from the festival in 2018. Different games were organized for the children uh, learn, who were learning Vepsin at school. Um, local food was served and also new dresses were sewn in the schools as well, maintaining then the colors of the traditional Vepsian festive dress, red and white. Uh, the locals again demonstrated agency and creativity around such events, showcasing how VEPs in different parts of the Vepsian, Vepsian territory could implement initiatives they considered suitable for their community, often distinguishing themselves from initiatives taken elsewhere. Right, so. The creation of such spaces has provided VEPs with the opportunity to exercise their rights both as individuals and as a collective national indigenous minority of Russia. They have carved a niche for themselves where they can speak in their heritage language, engage in more fluid ways um, of speaking, of expressing themselves, and make connections with long-standing ways of speaking among the Vepsian population. Yet some communicative practices appear not to have been included in the revival movement and those remain on the margins of such efforts. 
Indeed, while both directions in the revival of the Webster language and culture aimed at social justice, equal opportunities, inclusivity, certain communicative practices and parts of the population are yet not included in the movement. And I'm referring in particular to communication that has emerged in rural areas in, the, in relation to both human and non-human entities dwelling in this territory. And some of those are the territory masters. And here I listed some of those. Metz Sijan, Metz Emag is uh, the host of the forest, Metz meaning forest. Vedian Ijan, Vedian Emag is actually the host of the water. That can be a lake, a river, uh, but just water in general. Then we have Kulbiet Ijan, Kulbiet Emag. Kulbiet is the sauna. Uh, it's a place where people go and, and wash a bath, usually once a week on a Saturday. So also the, the uh, host of, of the sauna. And then we have the Pirtinesian, Pirti Amag. Pirt is house, so is the host of the house, but not only of the house, but also the land on which the house is built. So there's an understanding that, you know, it comprises also the, the, the piece of land. Um, so given this, that's tend to, or Vepsian villagers, tend to employ respectful and tactful ways of speaking to avoid offending the territory masters and to maintain good relationships with them for peaceful living. If villagers need favours from the territory masters, such as having a successful fishing session, gathering mushrooms and berries, or even just getting out of the forest safely, they may engage in ritualized ways of speaking, which in Vefsian are called pakitas, which literally means specific words. So you need to say these specific words. And here's as an example in Vefsian and the translation there. Um, uh, and that's an example of one who decides where to build their house. And the answer will then appear in a dream. So they will talk to the, to the territory master ask and then wait for the answer to be revealed. If the request has even more weight, for example, finding lost cattle in the forest or healing an ill person or an ill animal, they may employ uh, other ritualized um, uh, ways of speaking called puheged. Um, Puch, uh, so to utter words, to blow out forcefully specific words, um, again, to reach a compromise with the territory masters. And this is an example on how to cure hernia. While these communicative practices have been segregated as folklore, hinting at a long gone past, they are still employed in Vepsian villages. Uh, primarily, yes, by elderly people, but they've been considered their strength and power. In Petras of Oz, for example, uh, I was warned when I indicated that I would go and live for a bit in the villages, I was warned that Veps might employ a language in a powerful, if not harmful way, and that I should be careful. This might indicate also a conscious decision by the activists to erase forms of communication that are viewed as exotic uh, and challenge social cohesion and could put the Vepsian community in a broad sense at risk. Or it might also indicate a general sense that such communicative practices do not address contemporary issues and therefore are not included in the revival efforts. So the experiences of hope and openness, uh, along with the still dominant feeling of community and society that many went through at the end of the Soviet Union, matched an imagination of bright and vibrant indigenous futures, where the efforts to revive cultures and languages often meant providing equal opportunities for all. In contrast, the more recent neoliberal attitudes and focus on individual needs have led to a retreat towards more intimate and local spheres where speaking an indigenous language provides comfort and solidarity and offers new opportunities for the speakers of, min of a minority and indigenous language in Russia. So this then brings us back to the beginning of my presentation. 
if citizenship is, si is tightly intertwined then with the notion of social justice and its focus on equality and equity, this case has shown the complexities in unpacking the experiences and meanings attached to such notions for a minority indigenous group and its individual men members. And yet, I also indicated how certain ways of speaking and also parts of the population continue to be marginalized, if not excluded from the revival efforts altogether. Sur spasib, meaning, but show many thanks.